We're here today to do a full breakdown of one of the most iconic time travel films of all time, Back to the Future, which was released in 1985. Back to the Future is the story of 17-year-old Marty McFly, who was accidentally sent 30 years into the past, the year 1955, in a time-traveling DeLorean invented by his close friend, scientist Doc Brown. In this cult classic film, they've got to figure out how to get Marty literally back to the future, which ironically turns out to be almost 40 years in the past for us right now today. This is part one of our breakdown. I'm Height. And I'm Cherie. And you've discovered Axiom Amnesia. A lot of you requested that we cover this film, and I can't wait for us to talk about it. But first, we want to thank all of the supporters who helped to make this video possible. If you want your name to appear alongside these contributors, make a one-time donation via Cash App or click the thanks button on this video, or you can head on over to patreon.com slash axiomamnesia or become a channel member by clicking the join button to enjoy all of the benefits of becoming a monthly subscriber. So we are very excited to be covering a full breakdown of the movie Back to the Future. And so just to give a little bit of context here, we start off in the movie and we are in first introduced to Marty McFly. We open up to Marty McFly and he's he goes to a house and there's this loud rock music. You got to remember it's the 1980s. So we got some more harder rock going on and he hooks up his guitar to the amp and it blows up <laughs> <laughs> blows him across the room <laughs> yeah so it kind of lets us know what type of uh, person he is so he's one of these young uh kids from the mid 80s who's into rock and roll and stuff and you know that actually tells you a lot pretty much uh just the all american teen of this time the mid 1980s you know loves rock and roll loves other things and so while we're talking about this michael j fox is the actor who plays marty mcfly now if you're a little too young to actually remember the sitcom um Family Ties, that's really where people saw him first. And then this movie came out right around the time he was filming Family Ties as well. So not only was he a breakout star on this sitcom as the teen son, my, uh, I think his name was Alex P. Keaton, uh, and everybody knew him because he was like this obnoxious Republican who was the son of hippie parents. So his parents were liberals. And so that was kind of the, you know, back and forth play and, and, and comedy that would be on this television show. And so this character is very different than Alex P. Keaton. You know, he's just like this run of the mill, regular teen who is, you know, just getting into stuff, always late for school. So when we first see him, he's in Doc's laboratory. So his friend Grown um, man. Uh, oh, not even just grown, like this old man. <laughs> Doc is very old. So this old man who, uh, you know, has all of these different gadgets and stuff at yeah. his laboratory. It's very weird, their relationship, because, you know, when it, the character that they show of Marty McFly doesn't seem like the type would, who, who would be that much into science per, and technology per se, except for the standpoint that he is a... Uh, I guess we would call him an electronic musician. Right. Because, you know, he plays uh, electric guitar. Right. So he's there in this laboratory. He's fiddling around. And then he the phone rings there and he gets a call. And it's Doc on the other end of the phone. Now, Doc is played by Christopher Lloyd, who we'll actually see later, but we hear his voice while he's on the phone. And he's asking Marty to meet him at 1.15 a.m. at the Twin Pines Mall. I'll see you tonight. Don't forget now, 1.15 a.m. Twin so like let's put this in perspective this is a 17 year old high school kid that he's like i've made a breakthrough you know and doc's been gone for a week he hasn't seen doc and now he's like oh meet me at the mall i've got this something i want to show you this old man talking to this you know teen this kid and he wants to meet him at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's very crazy. And they have a whole bunch of clocks all on the wall. So, you know, you go into it knowing that the movie is about time travel. You're introduced to time and then it's about prudence or whatever, because 
and promptness because he ends up being late because of whatever doc experiment he has going on with these clocks that are actually 25 minutes behind. I'm late for school. Well, and I think he was late because he's just always late because he doesn't really keep track of time. And that's a really good point that you brought up, Be, you know, and then Doc hears those things go off in the background. And Doc is like, hey, my experiment worked because the clocks are all exactly hey. 25 minutes slow. My experiment worked. They're all exactly 25 minutes slow. My Marty McFly was going to be late anyway because he probably would have to be at school at eight. Right. right. So he was just like, OK, I'll get going around eight o'clock. So do you think that from where Doc is at this point, like he hears the clocks and he's like, they're exactly 25 minutes slow. So why would the clocks be 25 minutes slow? Whatever experiment he dad did. Right. Maybe he sent them into the past or something. I don't know. We know y'all know out. a whole lot about like all of this and as far as the, the theories of time traveling in these movies, how this stuff works. So we'll touch on it from time to time, but go to the comments and let us know what the deal is with what the 25 uh, minute clock, you know, being clocks being 25 minutes slow was indicative of as a clue, but beyond just the fact that we're right. already talking about time. Because they give us a lot of clues about, you know, time travel in the lead up, right? So he basically jumps on a skateboard, typical 1980s mm -hmm. white boy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, rock and roll. And, Power is a curious thing. and he travels on over to school and they show you. They're basically just showing us what this town looks like, where he is actually from. Mm -hmm. Because it's very pivotal to the plot of the film. And he's like car surfing with on the back of cars holding on with his skateboard to get to school faster right and we even hear in the background the power of love is the song that's blaring that's mm -hmm. by Huey Lewis in the news it's the power of love. and most people have heard this whether from this movie if you've seen it and are old enough to know this movie or you know it's just popular it's uh, one of those songs that has kind of stood the test of time it's been commercials and all that kind of stuff so it should sound familiar to most folks so when Marty gets to school, because he's late, his girlfriend Jennifer's coming down the stairs like, don't come in this way because, you know, we're going to get in trouble. Marty, don't go this way. Strickland's looking for you. If you get caught, it'll be four tardies in a row. And so they go in and they are caught by the principal. Well, Doc, I might understand you're still hanging around with Dr. Emmett Brown McFly. And Strickland. St yes. And so Strickland is like, oh, you know, what are you doing? Have you been hanging out with... Uh, the doc again the doc is no good stay away the from doc him the doc isn't ain't dangerous he's a nutcase <laughs> exactly the so called dr brown is dangerous he's a real nutcase yeah so that's letting us know but like if you're watching it as a teen or maybe a young adult you probably don't think this is all weird guy starting mm -hmm. off right because as a, someone as a teenager that age you probably like i wish there was this older person who would allow me to have freedom. Right? right. Treat me like an adult, which he does. You know, he's like, let's Marty be all in his house when he's not there. And he doesn't mind that he's there. And he just kind of treats Marty like an adult. Yeah. And then Strickland calls him a slacker. He's like, you're a slacker. Attitude problem, McFly. You're a slacker. And your father was a slacker, too. You remind me of your father when he went here. He was a slacker, too. So now we get to find out like this dude was at the school when his dad was at the school. And he has these comments about his daddy, though, too, which is like, I don't know of any relationship like this with administration at any school that I've went to. Hmm. But I guess maybe because it's hinting that it's a smaller town, that it's like that. So now he's just bringing up, you know, that a McFly has never amounted to anything. Yeah. And the principal is just the principal for like 20 years or more. <laughs> Right. You know, already you you your parents see like when I was in school, it might be that that teacher had your sibling or something like that. Maybe your cousin. But like not usually the principal and the people there know your parents because they were students there. That's weird. But yeah, so that's what happens. And they, you know, wind up getting their uh, late pass and. You know, they go yeah. on. The other thing the principal says is like, you know, I heard that you're trying out for, you know, uh, basically for your him band to play. is on he's, a roster for the dance. Mm -hmm. after school. He's like, you're a loser. You're never going to amount to anything. And then he's like, no McFly has ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. That's the town that they live in. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. So, yeah. Yeah. And then we get a nice line that sets it up. 
history is going to change. Well, history is going to change. Mm-hmm. Bruh, brilliant. Yeah, very brilliant. So then when Marty goes to try out, he's playing a song, which is, uh, you know, playing it instrumentally on his uh electric guitar it turns out to be one of the main songs that's actually from the movie sung by Huey Lewis <laughs> Huey Lewis is actually one of the judges judging him to see if his band you know should be the band for this um you know event or whatever and he's like when he hears him playing it's like what no 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 and then he's just like you guys are simply too loud I'm afraid you're just too darn loud Next place. And so the funny part that you're not going to catch is if you don't recognize this is Huey Lewis from Huey Lewis in the News, the actual band that's singing these songs, right? Who's, you know, kind of a rock and roll guy who would never say this is too loud playing this straight laced uh, judge. Then, you know, that's actually an added element of humor in there. Yeah. But see what we get here, too, is a great little setup because like when we go back and watch these, it sets up where this was in time. Like it, it probably wouldn't make sense to someone who didn't understand what was going on, where you have this battle between the old and the young. And I don't know who, how that would be played out if it was to be filmed in today's time. Right. But it's that, okay, you're playing this style of music and you can't even get on basically this talent show <laughs> or whatever the school dance roster is, who's going to be playing because of, you know, we're not, you're doing all this new stuff and you're just new, obnoxious teenager. Yeah. And I think that's funny. And then I don't know if there's another connection, but the name of their band is the Pinheads. For the Pinheads. And I, you know, maybe there'll be something that'll tweak our uh, memory of twin Pinheads or why that might be significant, but I'm sure that it wasn't for just for any, you know, basic purpose that they, they there was a purpose why they did this. So next we see after this rejection of his band that Marty and Jennifer are walking down the street. And this must be, I guess, after school. And then in the background, we see a Mayor Goldie Wilson van where he's, you know, blaring out of the thing so that he's the mayor, but he's running again. Re-elect Mayor Goldie Wilson. Progress is his middle name. And then, he's a mayor of this seemingly predominantly white town mm -hmm. and he's black. In 1985. 1985. Yes. So that, I mean, you know, that was a pretty big feat to be that at that time in such a small town. And to even put it in a movie because there wasn't this idea of, okay, we're trying to push the boundaries or whatever. It would have just been in most movies. Typically, yo, okay, everything is white in mm -hmm. every movie. That's just the default, right? right? So then we see Marty and Jennifer talking about everything. And he's like, oh, I just don't know if I can you know, take the kind of rejection. I mean, I just don't think I can take that kind of rejection. Because apparently he wants to be a musician and he wants, you know, she's encouraging him to send in his demo tapes. Yours is great. You've got to send it into the record company. And we also find out one reason why he probably does like Doc, because Doc says, you know, put your mind to it. Or you could do anything. Yeah, I know. Saying. I know. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. He really is positively impacting this young um, 17 year old kid by, you know, giving him the self-esteem that he needs. Plus, you got to remember that Doc is older than his father and Doc would have been around to see who his father was in this small town, too. And even in this conversation, he's like, oh, I don't know if I could take this kind of rejection when Jennifer encourages him to send his a demo tape to the record labels and stuff because that's what they were doing back then uh, quite different than to, well I think it's very different than today where you have a lot more independent artists and things like that back then you send it into the record labels and hope to get a deal yeah but so one thing that was really important too so in the late 50s and in the 60s and even through the 70s you had you know this big interest in science because of the space race and all of that stuff that was going on, the Apollo missions and all of that. And then later on, you had people like Carl Sagan who would come along and try to keep that enthusiasm for science going. Right. So Doc Brown is kind of like an extension of that where he's trying to get this guy into science by what he's doing, too. Mm -hmm. Right. And even this movie is a part of that journey because, you know, time travel, people do get interested in that. And it's kind of like an extension of that interest into space and space travel. So they were doing a good job with bringing that into. But they do make lots of references to time in here 
Yes. One of the things that we do see is a parking meter right behind the couple. That bad. Oh, Save the clock at least he's letting you borrow the car tomorrow Save night. With, you know, like a two hour time limit or something like this, is just those little things that they throw in there. And of course, you know, the clock tower. Yes. Yes. And so the way we find out about the clock tower is a woman comes up and she's trying to take do solicit donations to save the clock tower. Save the clock tower. Save the clock tower. Which she explains has not been running since lightning struck it 30 years ago. 30 years ago, lightning struck that clock tower and the clock hasn't run since. And so they want to keep it in its current state and so on. And so she's soliciting donations. Another thing that comes up is just this idea that Marty is just, he sounds just like his father. He says that in this scene. Jesus, I'm starting to sound like my old man. And also he sort of refers to his mother like, I think she's like innocent like a nun is what I should really kind of say. Like she's- How she never did that kind of stuff when she was a kid. I mean, look, I think a woman was born a nun talks about how she never did anything bad because they're talking about the fact he looks over, he sees this big Toyota 4x4 truck. That is hot. That for the time is just like this amazing truck that any kid or, you know, young adult probably would have wanted. And so when he sees that, he starts hugging on his girlfriend. He's like, oh, just imagine if we were to go out, you know, by the lake and whatever. And so they're planning to spend the night. Throw a couple of sleeping bags in the back. Uh, we find out he's lied to his parents and said that he was going to be camping with the boys, but he's really going to go camping with Jennifer. Oh, get out of town. My mom thinks I'm going camping with the guys. Now, I feel like, you know, this might be the first time that they're going to do the do uh, when they go spend the night. And so Jennifer says, well, does your mother know? Does your mom know about tomorrow night? And that's where he starts talking about his mother. Like, no, no, I told her I was going with the guys because there's no way I'd tell her that I'm going with you, you know, because she talked about how she didn't do things like that back in the day. But then I'm thinking, Jennifer, where are your parents? Do mm. they know <laughs> you going up here by the lake with this guy to camp out and spend the night and do whatever, you know? So, but it was the 80s and, you know, we're looking at rebellious teens. Jennifer. Jennifer's father actually interrupts the kiss that they're having when he comes to pick her up. So he says that um, Marty says he'll call her and she's like, I won't be home. I'll call you tonight. Uh, I'll be my grandma's here. So she gives her grandmother's number instead. And let me give you the number. And this is just a point to make you guys remember this is 1985. There are no cell phones. People aren't even really using pagers like that at this point. So He's got to get her grandmother's number so he can call her. Back then, you had to be at the location where the landline phone was. And if you were meeting up with someone, you had to be on time. Mm -hmm. Right. So one thing is because let's say they're trying to sneak out and one has to call the other. Then you're going to alert their parents or whoever their guardian at the time. Right. So you might be like on Friday. Hey, and. Saturday at 830, we're going to meet up at this place. But if you show up and the person's not there, then you're probably not going to stick around for that long. Be or, or you're going to get in trouble or you're going to think that something happened. And, you right. just are in, you know, it's not not like, oh, I'm just going to drop a pin with my location. It doesn't work like that. So Marty finally goes on home. And as he's pulling up, well, as he's walking up, he sees that a tow truck is parking his father's totaled car in the driveway. <laughs> And he's like, what the heck? Then he walks in on his father and Biff, who is his father's supervisor. You loan me a car without telling me it had a blind spot. Blind spot. I could have been killed. And this is our first time being introduced to him, to them. His father is played by Gr Crispin Glover. Now, the interesting thing here is that Crispin, Crispin Glover and the mother are aged in this movie. So they're actually really pretty close to the age of Michael J. Fox at this time, you know, who's playing Marty. So they're all like the same age because as we'll see with what happens in the movie, we're going to need to see younger versions of them. So Biff is like a bully. You know, Biff has borrowed and wrecked, borrowed his father's <laughs> car, wrecked it. I spilled beer all over when that car smashed into me. Who's going to pay my cleaning bill? And, you know, is like, Physically abusing him, knocking on his head, talking about, hello, McFly, anybody home? And hello, 
Hello, anybody home? Oh. I think we're fine. Oh. We also find out the father is doing Biff's uh, reports at work, and Biff's like, you know, I need I need time to rewrite my reports in my handwriting. So, uh, do you realize what would happen if I handed my reports in your handwriting? They're not even like using computers and like printing things out. Like you're still doing handwritten They're not reports. Not even typewriter. Not even the typewriter. So the father, you know, looks like kind of like this nerdy wimp for back in the day. uh, Stereotypical nerd. Mm -hmm. He has pocket protector. He has the IBM uh, shirt and tie. Mm hmm. You know, and so Biff is say, dropping these lines like, what are you looking at, butthead, when he sees Mar- uh, Marty looking at him like disgusted? What are you looking at, butthead? Because Marty is pissed off because the car is totaled now. And we know what Marty was going to be doing in that car over the weekend out at the lake uh, and camping with his girlfriend. He's like, you don't know how bad I needed that car. I needed that car no more like that. I mean, do you have any idea how important this was to me? His father... Oh, on the way out when Biff's leaving, he's like, oh, say hi to your mom, talking about Marty's mom and says that to him. Say hi to your mom for me. And we'll find out why in the future. But Biff just happens to be my supervisor. The father comes up and he starts talking about, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not good at confrontation. I know. Afraid I'm just not very good at confrontations. So like even the son is like, dad, you, you're going to have to stand up for yourself. I'm sorry. But he doesn't, you know, and so Marty's mad because he needed that car and he doesn't have it. And the father comes off as just this complete weakling. Girls chasing boys. When I was your age, I never chased a boy or called a boy. Or... The McFly family is having a very casual dinner. <laughs> yes. Your Uncle Joey didn't make parole again. Basically, what happens is they're just basically talking about how the parents met. Mm-hmm. Right, which is very integral to the story that we're going to see. That was so stupid. Grandpa hit him with the car. It was meant to be. So we find out that Marty's grandfather, his mother's father, actually hit his dad with the car. If Grandpa hadn't hit him, then none of you would have been born. And brought him inside. And that was how the mother and the father met when they were in high school. And then she says she felt sorry for the father and she wound up going to this dance with him and whatever. You felt sorry for him, so you decided to go with him to the fish under the sea dance. And she also references this bad storm that happens that night. It was the night of that terrible thunderstorm, remember, George? And that they had kissed for the very first time when they went to that dance together. Your father kissed me for the the very first time on that dance floor. And she said she realized then that he was the one. But what's funny is when she's looking at him now, it looks like she totally regrets it. <laughs> and earlier in the conversation, they were talking about her brother, who she's made this sort of ugly cake for, um, who was supposed to be getting parole and coming home, but he didn't. So unfortunately, Uncle Jailbird Joey, in Marty's words, um, you know, did not make parole from prison. Uncle Jailbird Joey? He's your brother, Mom. Yeah. And they're talking about him like, oh, that's your brother, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a major embarrassment having an uncle in prison. And And I think this is one of those subtle hints at class. Mm -hmm. Because we had the principal talk about how no McFly has ever amounted to anything. Then you see that basically the brother is working at is that a McDonald's Fast food uniform? or something like that or supposed like, to be like McDonald's yeah definitely. McDonald's like on mom make it fast I missed my bus the uncle is just basically a jailbird so it's subtle little things and she said we all make mistakes in life children we all make mistakes in life children so like that's the other part that they're the undercurrent is that she's not happy and she seems like you know She's just got a kind of a she's happy that she's got her family. But, you know, her husband is kind of like unimpressive and whatever. Yeah. But there's some TV show that's on on the television. And that probably was a thing they were trying to point out that people would sit around and watch TV now at the time. (laughs) In Mm -hmm. the 80s, which was like a change from. You know, they always make these sense of, oh, back in my day or nowadays people doing this. Like now they would say nowadays everybody's always on their phone. Right. Back then it would have been nowadays everybody just sitting in front of the TV. Right. When they used to have a time where everybody supposedly sit at the dinner table table and eat. 
right yeah and they're watching this show i don't know what show it is but the way that the dad and probably even the brother laughs reminds me of these guys on social media with the ah, ah, da- dad uh-huh. jokes uh-huh. they'd be like ah, 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 ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was just completely ridiculous. And if you know about movies or if you're old enough like uh, we are to know about these movies, if you know about movies from the 1980s, there was another franchise called Revenge of the Nerds. And it would very much remind you of how Crispin Glover as the, you know, Father McFly looks in this movie. Uh, very much the same. So if you didn't check that out, that's like an old 80s cult classic film, Revenge of the Nerds. And there's a few of them, like maybe three or four movies. So, yeah. So Marty is now after he's we've had this dinner, we've been introduced because that's what they're doing at this point in the film. They're introducing us to all of the characters, all of the big players, setting the background. We know what Marty's home life is. We know Marty kind of feels like a loser. We know he's hanging out with Doc, this older scientist. But he has a girlfriend and it seems like he's got some promise, which is probably more than his father had at the same age, you know. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens next. So he is waiting around for 1.15 a.m. to hit when he's supposed to go to the Twin Pine Malls and meet Doc. Hello. Marty, you didn't fall asleep, did you? Uh, Doc. Marty shows up at the mall around 1.16 a.m. He sees Doc's dog, Einstein. Einstein. Hey, Einstein, where's the doc, boy? Very important name because, you know, Einstein theories, uh, well, I'm not an expert on Einstein's theories of relativity or Einstein's work, but you have generally two kinds or you have two kinds of relativity. You have special and general. Special is the basically, you know, E equals MC squared, the relation between mass and energy and the speed of light and all of that. And then you have general, which is space time is like four dimensional Right. You got the three dimensions and then you have time and how matter curves space time. But in reference to time travel, it was kind of proven that, well, it's stated that the speed of light in the vacuum is basically or just the speed of light is the same for anybody who is observing. Right. So if I am traveling half the speed of light in one direction and then there's the and then I shine a light, it's still go, it's not going to be the speed of light plus one half the speed of light all the speed of light is always going to be constant just depends on who's looking at it Mm -hmm. and then if you reach that max speed then theoretically you can travel only into the future because that's the only way you're able to do it is by going i guess the speed of light or maybe even faster but i don't think that it is said that you can go faster than the speed of light that is the cap supposedly Yes. And so, you know, this is kind of like how I think these films and then uh, the theories sort of uh, meld together so that whatever we're seeing is believable. Right. They're dropping the name Einstein for the dog. But when you look at Doc, he kind of looks like Einstein about the hair. Right. (laughs) With this wild looking hair. So this is the first time we actually see Christopher Lloyd because we've heard his voice two times before. And now we get to, you know, put a face to the voice. So um, Marty gets there and Doc is like, hey, record uh, this experiment. Welcome to my latest experiment. This is a big one. The one I've been waiting for all my life. And and still talking about time, you know, Marty was asleep when Doc called him and was like, hey, go get my Kim Carter quarter before you're on the way here. So if Doc hadn't called, Marty probably would have overslept (laughs) and not even met him there, first of all. And And then then we don't even have a movie. I know. So like everything is just it had to happen exactly like this. I also think how they did the time to let us know was very artful. At first, we know what time he arrives at the mall uh, at 1.16 a.m. because the time is turning from 1.15 to 1.16 in the mall um, where, you know, the little placard or whatever that sign is has the time on it. And then Doc is doing his experiment, right? Please note, Einstein's clock it's in precise synchronization with my control lock. First thing he does in grand fashion is he reveals this DeLorean from the back of his truck. And it's like all of this smoke coming out and everything. You're like, what the heck? And so this heavily modified DeLorean doc is like, OK, we record this experiment with the dog in the car. Long story short, 
Doc uses this giant remote control to cl- control the DeLorean. And he's like, when this baby hits 88, talking about the DeLorean, you're going to see some serious shit. <laughs> <laughs> when this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. <laughs> and he's got the car coming directly towards him. He kind of revs it up and Bruh, then it's coming directly at them. It's not an them. experiment if you're just standing in front of the car <laughs> like that. They're saying, you know, for a fact, this is going to work. Exactly. So he's like, don't worry. OK, then we got Marty who's recording. He hasn't told Marty exactly what is going to happen here. So Marty's recording. He's looking at him. The car is revving and Doc is looking crazy. <laughs> Marty is like, okay, now the car is coming toward us. Don't we need to move out of the way? He's like, no, no, you know. Watch this, watch this. And then it leaves a trail of fire between their legs. And the car disappears at around 1.20 a.m. The thermal displacement occurred exactly 1.20 a.m. in zero seconds. You know, Marty is freaking out. He's like, oh, you've disintegrated Einstein. What happened to the car? Jesus Christ, Doc, you disintegrated Einstein. Doc says something very interesting. He's like, oh, no, he said, where are they? That's what Marty says. And Doc says, the question really isn't where are they? It's when are they? The appropriate question is when the hell are they? And now we're looping everything back together with this question of time and time travel. So we find out that he sent Einstein the dog one minute into the future. I sent him into the future one minute into the future so basically if they just wait a minute einstein's going to show up because for him this travel was instantaneous 121 a.m in zero seconds we shall catch up with him at the time machine and so they caught up with time with the dog and now the dog is there you know look out We see more suspense to wonder if the dog is dead in the car or what, because the car is like all this frozen ice on the outside. That's what happened. It is a success. The next thing we see is Doc explain how to operate the car. First, you turn the time circuits on. He hops in and he's showing how, hey, you just enter these times. This readout tells you where you're going. This one tells you where you are. This one tells you where you were. And he demonstrates, oh, I could go see, you know, the birth of Christ or, you know, some other events throughout history. You want to see the signing of the Declaration of Independence? And then he's just like, for instance, November 5th, 1955. And he, and then Marty's like, well, what's that? And he's like, that's the day I invented time travel. That was the day I invented time travel. <laughs> so he basically tells this story how he fell and hit his head. I slipped, hit my head on the edge of the sink. And when I came to, I had a revelation. And then he thought of this idea of the flux capacitor, which is basically the key to how this time travel machine works. This is what makes time travel possible. The flux capacitor. So the car runs on plutonium because it needs this nuclear reaction in order to work. Oh, it requires something with a little more kick. Plutonium. And so then we find out that Doc has stolen the plutonium from Libyan nationals who paid him to create a bomb. Don't just walk into a store and and buy plutonium. Did you rip that off? And so Doc was just straight up crazy. <laughs> Bro, they paid him to build a bomb and he built a time machine. And, and sent them a fake bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Took their plutonium and in turn gave them a shiny bomb casing full of used pinball machine parts. <laughs> so then they get dressed up in their hazmat suits or whatever. And they, they do this demonstration on how to load the plutonium into the vehicle. And so now that the experiment has worked with Einstein, the dog, then Doc decides, you know, he's going to be the first human in to human to go into t- the future via time travel. That's where you're going. That's right. 25 years into the future. I've always dreamed of seeing the future. And so that's what Doc is planning to do. And, you know, they have this moment like, wow. And Marty is just like, well, look me up when you get to the future. Uh, look me up when you get there. Indeed, I will. You know, and he's like, I will. No problem. Next thing you know. The Libyans come. Oh, my God. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. And they're driving this VW van. What do you think? The Libyans! How did they know he was at the mall? Hey, he said he didn't even know how they found it. He's like, they found me. And then they start shooting. 
Doc, you know, they got like an automatic weapon. Doc has like this revolver and he's going to try to shoot back. It's just a mess. So eventually they uh, wind up shooting Doc and he's just laid out and Marty is like, no, you know. No! The gun jams when they try to shoot at Marty. And Marty tries to get away. So he hops in the car and he takes off. And they're racing around in him behind him in this VW van in the parking lot of the Twin Pines Mall. We already know what's going to happen when he hits 88 miles an hour. Yeah, because Doc has already told us when he hits 88 miles per hour, that's when Einstein is going to go into the future, basically. Yes. And so, <laughs> we but, know what year and everything because it was programmed that was interrupted as they were just talking. Right. And Marty's like, let's see if you can do 90. Let's see if you bastards can do 90. So he doesn't know that he's about to go. Or, and he's not thinking about it, right? His adrenaline is rushing. He's just trying to, you know, he's seen his friend just, uh, you know, get mowed down and he's trying to avoid it. He doesn't want anything to happen to himself. So he's just like, let me see if I can outrun you in this DeLorean. And he guns it. And when he does, he's heading right for, for a photo booth. Now, for those of you who are too young to know, because I don't, I don't think I've seen a photo booth in the mall parking lot in a long time, but they used to have these photo development places where you would drop off the film from your camera for the youngins. We used to actually have our film have to get developed when we took pictures and uh, it wasn't digital. So you take it to a place where they would develop the film for you uh, into the photographs that you see, you know, which look old and, uh, you know, yellow probably by now. So that was what it is. So he's heading for this photo booth that we can kind of see in the background as he's driving around, but he doesn't, you know, hit it. It's like, oh, this flash. And the next thing you know, he's in cornfields. <laughs> And it's confusing to him. And he rolls into it, basically this barn. Ah! So this family um, who lives on their farm, they think that Marty is an alien when they see him because of his hazmat suit. That ain't no airplane. Look. And they are just scared to death. Because, you know, the kid's been reading this comic book about aliens. And, you know, so he comes out finally after they're scared off and he's trying to get help. But then they start shooting at him. Take that, you mutated son of a bitch. And yeah, so you got to <laughs> kind of think of the zeitgeist, right? Where you had, you know, in the earlier part of the century, the invention of airplanes and that sort of thing right and then after that you started to get so-called ufo sightings and stuff right and people started talking about aliens and stuff c coming to visit right before the space race stuff that um you know i mentioned earlier so all of that is going on at this time and so when they see this and this car that just looks funny yeah their imaginations are running wild and the kid is like, it's already mutated in the human form when they actually do see Marty's face. It's already mutated in the human form. Shoot it! And, you know, and he's still got the hazmat uh, thing on. And so the father just starts shooting at Marty again. And then Marty hops in the car and then he just drives off. And poor Marty, because he's been shot at two times within minutes in really two different times. 30 years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he's been shot at twice within 30 years. That's so unimaginable. Yes. So um, we see Marty and he's driving the car. The sun is starting to rise. All right. All right. Okay, let's fly. And Marty is telling himself that this is just an intense dream. Like he does not believe what he is seeing. It's all a dream. It's just a very intense dream. Then he pulls over and he sees the subdivision that he lives in in 1985 with his family. And it's just now being built. The other clues that there are cars in this in the, in the billboard that's advertising it you know everything looks like the 1950s he's kind of getting clued in that we ain't in kansas anymore uh but he still doesn't want to believe it then he tries to drive some more the car has lost power so he's got to get rid of it 
but he is smart enough to leave his modern technology, like the Walkman and whatever, in the car. And then he hides the car behind a billboard. And then he heads into town. And when he heads into town, we are anticipating as viewers seeing what this town square that we've already seen before in the introduction of what it looks like in 1985, what it must have looked like in 1955. So when he goes into the town, we hear music playing. It's like Mr. Sandman. The music is now indicative of 1955. And it's in stark contrast to the rock music of 1985. Marty is still dressed in his 1985 with the clothes, though, as he walks around and he's looking at everything in the town like, I, I mean, this is familiar, but it's like from the way, way back times. And he still just cannot believe it. We also see the clock tower in the background, and then we actually know it's working because we hear the bells. And think about it. Marty never heard the clock tower bells in his lifetime because they, you know, the lightning strike that took it out, took it out before Marty was ever even born. Right. But one thing that we did get from the past was the Mr. Foster Travel Service that said it had been in service in 1985. It said it had been in service since what looked like 1908. Mm. So that's still there. It's a travel service kind of similar to what Doc had built. So, yeah. So there's familiarity that's there, but things are still quite different. So Marty, see, oh, in the background, remember how we saw Goldie's mayor van and it was going around trying to get you to reelect Goldie as the mayor? Well, we see here in 1955, Red Thomas was the mayor and he's in quite stark contrast to, to Goldie. Reelect Mayor Red Thomas. Progress is his middle name. So Marty goes into this diner and he looks on the wall. The coffee's only five cents. You know, I'm assuming in 1985, the coffee was probably about 50 cents, I would imagine, somewhere in that range. So it's 10 times as much as it, you know, or 10 times less than it was in 1955. The guy who's working behind the counter, he's like, hey, you know, what happened? You, you know, you, why do you have a life preserver on? What? What's with the life preserver? Because he's wearing this, um, you know, vest that's like a jacket and it, a sleeveless jacket vest. And... This guy hasn't seen these fashions because he's still wearing his 1985 clothes. So he goes and he tries to use the phone to call for help. But the number he dials, nobody answers the number. And he's just trying to figure out what in the heck is going on. So the guy's getting annoyed with him because he's like, are you going to buy anything? Because you're coming in here asking a bunch of questions. Do you know where 1640 Riverside? Are you going to order right. something, kid? So he's like, yeah, give me a tab. Give me, give me a tab. What that meant was a tab soda. If you're, I don't even know if they still sell tab today. Do you? I don't think they do. Was it a Coke product or did they, did Coke buy it later on? I don't know. But I just remember tab soda. So tab was a sugar-free soda, like Diet Coke or Diet Pepsi, right? And then he doesn't know what a tab is. Tab, I can't give you a tab unless you order something. So then he's just like... Uh, OK, give me a Pepsi free, something without sugar. So even Pepsi free, I don't think they have that anymore today. You know, there's just Diet Pepsi and whatever the different products in the Diet Pepsi line. So Pepsi free was a product that they had for a while, obviously, in the 1980s, but that didn't survive to now. All right. Give me a Pepsi free. You want a Pepsi, pal? You're going to pay for it. So the guy still doesn't know what he's talking about. And this is a culture class. In one of our uh, reviews, I forget which one, you talked about what makes, you know, for the interesting things that happen in these movies is the culture class where you come from different places. Or in this case, he's coming from a different time, right? And all the stuff that's different and creating a conflict as a result of the uh, the culture clash that they're having. Yeah, when you're like his age, though, in age probably when most of us first saw this, when you think of 30 years prior, it seems so far away. Mm -hmm. But then when you're 30 years from the first time you've seen this movie, you're like, wait, that's not that far in the no. past. And how are things so different? Well, and, you know, it's just like, think about it. He's 17. 30 years is like practically about the same as double of his age, right? Two right. lifetimes for him to that point. And, you know, somebody who is 60, that's only half their life, you know? And if you're uh, 30, well, that's your whole life, you know, and, and, and so on. So I think that 
that is the well, yeah. perspective so of time. That's why you have to have a young person like this so that they haven't experienced this and it's completely foreign to them. If you took someone who had experienced this, then you'll probably be you can fit in better, right? You know how to use the phones and how to order things at a, such a diner. So if we went back to 19, um, 93, yeah. 94, uh-huh. then we're able to just fit in. Like, yeah, we're like, nothing. oh, let me get that big brick cell phone. And uh, <laughs> yeah, <let me laughs> oh, yeah, I got to remember colors. how to put these freeze curls in my hair. You can get some extra baggy clothes, like you said, cross, cross colors and stuff like that. And then, of course, we would start playing the lotto. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you're right you're absolutely right because if we've been there before it's not a big deal you can just slide right in and if you think about it if doc had gone back in time doc would know doc was in, in that time right we know exactly he would know how to get along and what to do but this kid is like straight panicked because all of his creature comforts are not things that exist in this time. Also, you didn't have that much experience, right? Nowadays, you probably go watch a lot of movies and documentaries and read a lot of books about what it was like in the 50s and kind of get an idea here, watch YouTube videos, and we tell you how it was 30 years ago. But this guy, he would only get kind of what was possibly in the news and what he read somewhere. And maybe the TV shows, right? Because you had the shows like Leave It to the Beaver and the old stuff that would be coming on in the 80s that was like reruns the same way as today. You have, you know, shows that are 20, 30 uh, or even more years old that, that run in uh, reruns across a multitude of different stations. So, yeah. Yeah, but when they're showing those technologies and stuff from then and you don't know about it, you don't know what's going on, really. That's true. Exactly. So he's in this diner, Marty is, and then in comes a group of guys. Fly. And he realizes that it's Biff. What do you think you're doing? Biff. Biff is not talking to him, but he hears McFly and then he's like, calls McFly. Hey, I'm talking to you, McFly, you Irish bug. He realizes that this is young Biff and his young father. Oh, hey, Biff. Hey, guys, how are you doing? In this diner, and Biff is still the bully, and he's like, McFly, where's my homework? And so we already know, because we've seen this just a few minutes ago, what this dynamic is. And it actually helps you to understand why the father is like he is in 1985 when you think about for 30 years this dude has been getting bullied by this same guy. So Marty is completely freaked out because Biff and his dad literally have the exact same conversation in 1955 as we saw in 1985, except instead of reports for work, it's about his homework. Hello? Anybody home? I mean, literally word for word. Word for word. But... The way that Biff talks, it, he talks just like Trump. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he does. And I don't think this is how they saw Trump in 1985. I, <laughs> I now see that, Biff, that Trump talks like I know of Biff from the movie in 1985. And that's kind of crazy because, you know, I think in the 80s he was considered like this mogul and this. I don't want to use the word hero, but like, yeah, he was like revered, you know, you know? revered. He was rich lifestyles of the rich and famous types. You know, it was before all of, it was before these broadly known scandals and certainly before he was actually the president uh, long before that. But very interesting that we have observed similar mannerisms. But yeah, he Biff is the same. Everybody is the same. And I think the underlying theme here is that even though people may grow up or whatever, Like their personalities are not really changing. Yeah, they grow up and they get another job, but they're going to act the same way generally as they, you know, the core of their personality. So it doesn't matter that this is 30 years later. Bullies are still bullies. The bullied a lot of times are still in those vulnerable positions. And that is kind of an un, well, they didn't state it openly, but that's something you could take away from this scene. So the next thing we see is Marty talking to his father and in talking to his father, he's like, you're George McFly. And he's like, yeah, because, you know, he's just staring in his face. What? You're George McFly. Yeah. Who are you? Then we see Goldie, the black guy who's the mayor in 1985, is working in this diner in 1955. Say, 
What do you let those boys push you around like that for? And he comes up to George McFly and he's like, man, why don't you didn't stand up for yourself? Well, they're bigger than me. Stand tall, boy. Have some respect for yourself. George is like, because they're bigger than me. And he's like, man, you got to, you know, and he's giving him some esteem about himself. He's like, one day I'm going to be somebody. Don't you know if you let people walk over you now, they'll be walking over you for the rest of your life. Uh, you know, and he's like, you think I'm going to work in this place my whole life? I'm going to night school and all of that. Look at me. You think I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this slop house? What? And then Marty's like, you're going to be mayor. I'm going to be somebody. That's right. He's going to be mayor. Which then <laughs> poses the, I guess, the time travel question, the, you know, the what timeline, the, the dilemma, paradox yeah. question and dilemma of did Marty now make Goldie the mayor because he gave him the idea? Huh. Because we know he was the mayor later, but this is, you know. So it then seems that all these different things that was going on in 1985 was brought about because of Doc and Marty. Mm hmm. Yeah. The even the owner, though, he's like, yeah, a colored mayor. That'll, that'll be, be the, the day. day. <laughs> I could run for mayor. A colored mayor. That'll be the day. You yeah. And so you had pointed out earlier, kind of like you would have expected the mayor to be uh, white, even in 1985. And the notion that a black man or a colored man, as they called him back then, could be mayor in 1955 or anywhere in the future was just completely out of the question in the minds of most people. But Goldie was like, yeah, mayor. I could see myself being mayor. Mayor. Now that's a good idea. And I think that shows what a um, unique person that he was. In this way. So the next thing we know, we look up and Marty's dad, George, has left the diner. And Marty is going to go try to see where he's gone, because at this point he's in the in the past. He doesn't even really know anybody. He hasn't connected. He doesn't know what to do. Right. And he still it, it ha still hasn't occurred to him. How am I going to get back to the future? Back to the future. So Marty actually yells after his dad when he's chasing him and he's like, dad, uh, George. And he chases him to this residential area. Dad, George, hey, you in the fight. He doesn't see where he's gone and then he sees, oh, okay. Well, and looks up and he's in a tree. And he realizes that his dad is a peeping Tom. Still don't understand what dad was doing in the middle of the street. Bless you, George. Looking over into the window of a girl who turns out to be his mother, right? With binoculars, he falls from this tree. <laughs> and that's how he was in the street about to get hit by the car. The person driving the car, as we know from the future in 1985, as the story was told, is actually his grandfather talking about Marty's grandfather, his mother's father. Anyway, your grandpa hit him with the car and brought him into the house. So Marty's like, oh, dad, he sees him about to get hit, pushes his dad out the way, and Marty gets hit by his Bro. grandfather's car. <laughs> and now he's and knocked out instead. This is the quintessential conflict in time travel is when you go and you interfere with what happened in the past this is the pivotal moment in the movie back to the future besides what happened to doc this is where oh now we're going to be messing up right and to time. get back to his dad actually being like a peeping tom when they were having that conversation at the dinner table and the mom was telling the story of how they met for the umpteenth umpteenth time then the, the, she was like, well, George, what were you doing in the middle of the street? And, and the father for 30 years has never admitted that he <laughs> was being a peeping Tom looking into Lorraine's uh, window. So the thing is, Lorraine's like, and we met because the her father brought this guy he hit inside right. the house. But right? you met because he was a peeping Tom who fell out of a tree in front of your dad's car. And... That's how she met him. He already knew her <laughs> because he's been looking well, in her window. <laughs> yeah, but this is one of those situations where, you know, in the movies, they always be like, oh, nobody recognizes or notices this one person who is the nerd or the geek or whatever. But, you know, they know them. And that's what we had here. She never noticed them until he actually was brought into the house. 
Yes. And so that's what happened. And now we as the audience quickly realize that Marty is in the place of his father in this situation. Now Marty's granddaddy is about to take him inside and things are really going to be screwed up because now his mother's going to see Marty instead of Marty's dad. Mom, is that you? So <laughs> Marty is in the dark and he hears his mother's voice, which is a real comfort to him after all of this craziness has gone on. And so he tells her that he has had a dream, a bad dream, that he went back in time. Dream that I went Back in time it was terrible. And realizes that he is still back in 1955. 1955. When his mother is like, well, you're all right now. You're in good old 1955. Safe and sound now, back in good old 1955. And then the light comes on. He sees his mother, young and beautiful, um, in 1955 as compared with how she was looking in 1985. Then he's like, well, where are my clothes, you know? And ah, where are my pants? Over there. She, his mama done took his pants off and stuff. His and she mama keeps, was fast. She was fast. And she keeps on calling him Calvin. Calvin, why, why do you keep calling me Calvin? Because that's the brand of the underwear he's wearing is Calvin Klein. And she is being real flirtatious with him. That's the big bruise you have there. Ah, ah. Very unlike the way that she describes herself as a teen. And even in how Marty thinks about her. Right? Yes. Yes. And so then, you know, he's trying to get away. He falls off the bed and makes a bumping noise. And so then we hear her mother call her. Oh, are you up there? Oh, my God. My mother. And, she, and we realize she's not even supposed to be in there with him. And she's like, quick, put your pants on. So, so we know she's the one who took them pants off and was looking at him while he was passed out from getting hit by her daddy. I guess you're a sailor, aren't you? That's why you wear that life preserver. They see uh, later as they're getting introduced to, as Marty is getting introduced to the rest of the family. He, so this is his grandmother who is pregnant, introducing him to his aunts and uncles. Milton, this is Sally. That's Toby. They come over and there's a baby who is inside of a playpen in bars and it is uncle jailbird joey in the crib as a baby so you're my uncle joey better get used to these bars kid what? and the grandmother make remarks that you know he likes being in there and every time we take him out of there he cries so we just leave him in there he cries whenever we take him out so we just leave him in there all the time and it's the comedy of knowing that he never can get out of jail when he's in 1985 so then the father rolls out this TV set. Look at it roll. Now we can watch Jackie Gleason while we... This is their first TV in their family in 1955. And he, Why about is their to first eat. TV they can roll out, though? I don't know. It's portable, you know, but <laughs> it is portable. They got their TV set and they're watching Jackie Gleason. And, Mar and they're like, oh, Marty, do you have a TV? He's like, yeah, you know, we have two. Do you have a television? Well, yeah, you know, we have because his mother is asking this questions and he's like, you know, so it's really confusing him because this is his mother. But his mother doesn't know him yet, you know, because he hasn't even been born. And he's like, yeah, we have two. Well, yeah, you know, we have two of them. And then they're like, nobody's got he must be rich because nobody's got two TVs. Must be rich. Oh, I'm He's teasing you. Nobody has two televisions. And then when you think about in 1985, two TVs was, you know, was pretty standard. And now what is that number in 2024? How many TVs do you think most households have? I don't know. Y'all need to let us know how many TVs Go to the you comments. have. Yeah, I would say the number of TVs is probably more than two. I would say probably three or four. Mm hmm. Maybe almost one TV per person. <laughs> yeah, like per bed, you have one in every bedroom and the living room and maybe more. And maybe the kitchen even, you know. Yeah. Um, and then plus, if you think about it, everybody has their cell phones. Yeah. And, you know, so. So was they watching the Honeymooners in the 1985 scene? Maybe that was it because it was in black and white. And maybe that was the significance of that. Uh, right. You know, them watching that. So their family's literally doing the same thing as Marty's grandparents were doing back in the day. And, you know, this we talk a lot about culture and class and everything you brought up that it was probably a class issue, the level that Marty and his family were living at in 1985. Well, when you look in 1955, you know, they remarked somebody must be rich, which implies to me that they're not, right? 
And they seem to be like a working class family that Lorraine came from. And uh, yeah. not much has changed with her lifestyle in 1985. That's right. And, you know, it isn't that they were actually poor. It's just, you know, they didn't, I guess, elevate to, you know, higher classes, which is typical of most people. Yeah. But so they're watching uh, the honeymooners and Marty remarks that, oh, he's seen this one. When I've seen this one. This is a classic. This is uh, where Ralph dresses up as a man from Spain. And then they're like, no, you haven't. How did you see this? It's new. What do you mean you've seen this? It's brand new. And he say, oh, it's a rerun. Yeah, well, I saw it on a rerun. It's a rerun. And then they're looking crazy. And then they're asking, like, <laughs> what is a rerun? And when I hear that, I immediately thought of this movie, Leave the World Behind, mm. where it was asked by the girl, you know, what was those things that were called, you know, where they would play the stuff again? And I'm like, whoa, this is complete full circle where <laughs> you have the idea of a rerun at first not happening right. yet into a point where this doesn't even matter because people aren't even watching to even know what a rerun is. It's on demand, right? And which is sort of eliminated the need for reruns. You know, you just whenever you want to play it, you can play it. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a good point about Leave the World Behind. I hadn't thought about that. But we actually did on our other channel, and we have videos on Leave the World Behind on this channel as well. We'll link the Leave the World Behind playlist for you in the description of this video. So the other thing that's interesting is, you know, JFK as president doesn't happen until after this point uh, in the 1960s, yeah. not 1950s. And so he, uh, Marty makes a reference to his grandfather of you know john f kennedy you know, black past maple that's uh that's john f kennedy drive and <laughs> he's like who's john f kennedy you know like who the hell is john f kennedy right and i guess it was kind of like maybe clinton and maybe barack obama who kind of just came out of nowhere mm -hmm. because 1955 wasn't too far away from when he was elected in 60. Right. And then there is that president, um, that president, that picture of uh, Clinton as a child shaking the hand of JFK. Huh. You know, and I believe he was one of his idols, if you will, or, you know, political. I think just like for the Democrats, this, he was just he was the standard, mm -hmm. basically, like everybody looked up to him. Yes. So in the meantime, Marty's mother is actually Lorraine. She's just like putting her hands all on him and just being flirtatious with him. Sleep in my room. I gotta go. Uh, I gotta go. His mother asks her mother whether Marty should just go ahead and spend the night. Well, with Marty's parents out of town, don't you think he ought to spend? the night you know because Bruh. his parents are out of town because of course marty's lies about it because his mother you know he's from another time uh, as a time traveler and so uh they're like his mother's like yeah i guess you know we're responsible for you now um or his grandmother says that to him so his mom continues flirting and everything and then he just gets up and he just runs out of the house gotta go bye-bye thanks very much it was wonderful you were all great uh see y'all later because, you know, it's just freaked him out that his right. mother is so different than the woman he knows as his mother in 1985. And, and after it's not just that she's different. It's that they're basically the same age and she's trying to get with him. Mm -hmm. And she's fast, too. Uh -huh. So it ain't like, OK, my mother's so innocent and I could just play along and then it just and just walk away. This is like, no, she's trying to take off the cover and see me in my underwear, uh -huh. and taking my pants off and stuff and touching fast. me under the table. Come yes. On. And so after he runs out of the house, his grandfather says of him, he's just like, the kid's an idiot. <laughs> uh, he's an idiot. Comes from upbringing. Parents are probably idiots, too. <laughs> and if you ever had any kid like that, I would disown you. Lorraine, you ever have a kid who acts that way, I'll disown you. And then, of course, this is the kid that he claims that he, that he would disown his uh, daughter over, which is just full circle, you know, hilarity uh, at the time. But it reminds me of the word idiot, right? Because that was just a much more frequently used word uh, back in the day. I don't hear idiot as much well, as I used to. Do you? Just go to Twitter or something and type it in. You see how oh, much it well, shows up. Yeah. I was just thinking of like films and yeah, popular culture, so. not as much on like the social media part. But yeah. So I, I thought that that was sort of funny. Uh, so 
now Marty has fled. And where is Marty going to go? He's in 1955. And who does he know? Who can he call? <laughs> he needs some help. He can call Doc. He know Doc is there and that's who he's looking for. That's right. Marty has got to find Doc. And that brings us to the end of this first part of our full breakdown of Back to the Future. So they have set up this movie marvelously. Uh, it's created the the problem. He's gone back in time. We know he's going to have to try to get himself extracted. But it, there are all of these complications everywhere he turns. His father's still the same person. His mother is still, well, his mother is completely different than he thought, right? Biff is still the same person. So he's got to figure out how to navigate all of this as a teenager who's the same age as his parents in this time. And, you know, where is he going to get the help? He's going to go to Doc. But how in the heck is he going to get back to the future? That's the question we'll answer in the next part. <laughs> We're halfway into the movie and we don't even we I would say we don't have anything that's happening. Right. We know all the problems. We, it's just a straight setup and we're halfway in and we don't know what's going to happen because he haven't even met doc. The whole thing is about time travel being stuck there. And it isn't until halfway where it's like, okay, now we can start solving just this first problem that we've seen since about 20 minutes into the movie. Well, I think what the brilliance of this movie has been is so far is that you're just impressed with how 1955 looks, right? You're impressed with how different the parents look than how they used to look. So what they did in this, which was quite interesting, instead of having a younger actress and an older actress, so two separate actors play the parents in their different times, they chose a younger actress and then, you know, and then they just age progressed them, I guess you could say. I, I think that that worked out reasonably well. But since the bulk of the time is going to be spent in 1955, they chose for that actor, you know, to choose the younger look, the, the younger actress, rather than having an older one and having a younger person, you know, just yeah, play the young version. Play them, since you won't even have to see them that much when they're grown. Right. And then like, you know, you're just, I found myself, I remember watching this movie and I've seen this movie a ton, ton, ton of times, you know, growing up and then even as an adult. And I, I can't help but feel like it was the experience of being, you know, a kid at this time thinking, Hey, these would be the same issues I'd have if I found myself in 1955, except, you know, I wasn't except, a white kid. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I'd be living more of the Goldie life and even worse because I'm a girl, you know, <laughs> but it definitely allowed you to. And, and for some reason, I think of the movie, the Barbie movie, right? Was I really watching the Barbie movie for a good plot or something? And the plot, you know, was just the cherry on top of the Sunday. To me, the Barbie movie, I wanted to see it because I just wanted to see the visuals. You know, yeah. so from my memory, they made a lot of uh, references to his vest. Mm -hmm. And when I, I as long as I can remember my memories, all of my memories of this movie is that the vest is futuristic, even though it wasn't. You know what I'm saying? So when I see him, because I think they bring it to the future. Right. And it's kind of the same mm -hmm. where it's like when I see this outfit, I think of the future. So it looks futuristic. Hmm. And I guess it's, you know, see, a lot of people, I, I had a vest like that growing up. Uh, in my youngest years, I was actually, you know, with my parents traveling and we lived in the South for a couple of years before we moved back to Chicago. And when that was going on, you know, it wasn't nearly as cold. You didn't have to have full on sleeves. You could wear a sweater and then the vest. And that was, you know, your cool uh, winter look, you know, so uh, that was quite popular in the 80s. I remember that I, I had a red vest. His is more of kind of rusty orange rusty or whatever orange. but yeah i had a red vest that i used to wear when i was in like first second grade so those were quite popular and also i think it's maybe more the fashion of the west or the northwest right where people are doing outdoorsy stuff and going camp and like he's talking about here and you know doing things like that i i think white water rafting <laughs> right but so, yeah if you made it this far into this breakdown, type Goldie in the comments so we'll know you're one of the real ones who stick around. And stay tuned for part two, where we will talk about the conclusion of Back to the Future and break that down for you, too. And if you're watching at a very much later date, maybe it's already out. So check the links in the description. Yeah.